Hey, it's Brian Bunce, pharma editor at Drug Discovery and Development and Pharmaceutical Processing World, and I'd like to welcome you to our final episode of Pharma 50 Talks for this year's Pharma 50. I recently got a chance to sit down with Omid Farouksad, the CEO of Seer, who explains how the company aims to remove technological barriers to studying the proteome. Omid details how he founded Seer, the company's journey, Seer's short and long-term goals, the next big development product advancement that the company is pursuing, and the Proteograph product suite that came out recently. I hope you enjoy our discussion. Nice meeting you, Omid. Thanks for making time to talk with me today. I thought I would kick things off by asking about your backstory. I know that you're an academic physician. You did your postdoc at MIT with Bob Langer. Maybe you can kind of give me a brief rundown on kind of like your background, and then we can go into what led to the founding of SEER. Yeah, nice to meet you, Brian, and thank you for having me on. So you're correct. I am a physician. Before finishing my medical degree, I really trained as a molecular biologist. In, I'm in our nose lab at MGH during college medical school. And then when I finished, I did a postdoc, Bob Langer at MIT, and, and as you know, that's the chemical engineering group. Bob runs a very multidisciplinary lab, various backgrounds come. And so it wasn't unusual for a physician to join Bob's lab. There were others before me that had gone there. And in fact, the interesting part of it is Bob himself as an engineer had done his own postdoc at Judah Folkman's lab. And as you know, Dr. Falkman is a cancer biologist at Harvard Medical School. So Bob was used to working with physicians and it was wonderful to train really orthogonally a totally different uh, set of language, if you would, that I learned during that period of time. And then I joined the Harvard Medical School faculty in 2004, which is where I had done my clinical training before and started a lab called the Lab of Nanomedicine. And the interesting part of it is that if you go back in time, do a PubMed search with the term nanomedicine, You literally have to go back to page one of the search returns uh, because back in 2004, there were about 12 papers published with nanomedicine term in it. Uh, So at the time when we started the level of nanomedicine, some folks asked, you know, what is that? It sounds unusual. It almost sounds a bit hypey. But then fast forward a decade later, we started a center called the Center for Nanomedicine at my institution at Brigham and Women's Hospital, which is a teaching hospital of HMS. And then today, virtually every major medical center or even engineering schools have departments, institutes, or centers of nanomedicine. And the impact of it has been brought across literally any dimension of medicine, therapeutic diagnostic discovery site. It's been great. Well, maybe you could talk as well about how you founded SEER and kind of what you see the place of the company in, in the space. So SEER was the f- fifth company that came out of our lab, our academic lab. So I had started the lab of nanomedicine in 04. I was primarily a scientist. I did very little clinical work early on and then no clinical work toward the latter part of my academic career. And so we had students and postdocs in the lab, very different background that each of them brought a very multidisciplinary lab. And core to the work that we did while I was there was developing nanoparticle technologies for medical application. And the lion's share of our work was actually on the therapeutic side. So when you want to develop a nanoparticle for therapeutic application, typically the particle is a carrier, delivers a drug. The surface of the particle is engineered for an application. So for example, targeting cancer or targeting immune cells. And we had developed technologies for a range of applications. One of the earliest work that we did was targeted nanoparticle for treatment of cancer. We brought the first example of a controlled release nanoparticle that can target cancer into clinical trial, and then later nanoparticles for immune activation and immune tolerance. Again, we now have examples of that in clinical trials. And a lot of that work really was making these particles functional in a biological system. And by that, I mean, you spend a ton of time designing uh, nanoparticles that do exactly what you want outside of the body. But the moment they hit a biological system, the surface of the nanoparticle binds to a lot of the macromolecules that may be present in a biological system. So for example, if it's an injectable drug, what's present in blood or plasma would bind onto the surface of the particle. Back then, and now we're going back, you know, almost 15, 20 years in time, we call that biofouling, fouling because we didn't like what was happening. And so there was a ton of effort, you know, predating my own training by many, many years, where a lot of efforts were going on to create non-biofouling surfaces for various different medical applications. It turned out that what we were considering fouling was actually totally inaccurate. 
And about 15 years ago, a group in Dublin published a, a very important paper showing that the binding of biological components to the surface of a nanoparticle is very precisely driven by the physical chemical nature of that particle and is highly reproducible. And they coined the term protein corona because you form a corona of proteins on the surface of the particle. Well, since then, the field continued to evolve. You know, today, almost a couple of thousand papers published in this area. And my own lab academically had published many papers in this as well, kind of looking at ways to engineer surfaces for desired biological outcome, which of course it means desired biological binding or not binding. And so there was a moment in time where a light bulb went off in our head, which is if the binding is highly reproducible and a function of the physical chemical properties of that particle, um, then by designing particles that have very distinct physical chemical properties, we can actually sample the proteome in a very unique way. And so that was really the, uh, the premise that formed the basis to start SEER, that we would essentially capitalize on what we had considered to be, if you would, a problem for us and the therapeutic space to really benefit from it in terms of uh, protein sampling, which was an area that we saw as huge, huge on that need, given all the impact and advances we had made in the genomic space in the last you know, 15, 20 years, the same advances in the proteomic were really at their infancy. And so the combination of the need scientifically, technological capability that for the first time allowed us to do that was the, was the premise to launch SEER. So in, in software speak, you took a, a bug and made it into a feature, like the protein corona. <laughs> Ex exactly, Brian. And you know, we, we have a big software group at SEER and my software team has said that and then they use the same thing, the talks that they give, but that's exactly what happened. Well, on a related note, I was wondering if you could talk about the proteograph product suite that came out recently. Yes, of course. So at SEER, what we do is we enable the, the scientific community to see the proteome at, with depth and breadth in ways that just hasn't been possible before. And as I mentioned, the reason that's important and you use software in making your comments, so let me follow the same lead. If you look at your genomic content or your DNA as the software code of life, then what it does and what it enables at the functional level happens at the protein level. So every, literally every function in the human body is because of, a, of an action of a protein or of a group of protein coming together to form functional modules to drive that. And so what SEER enabled was to access the proteomic information at the right depth and breadth with scale speed that just previously wasn't possible. The Proteograph product suite is the product that does that. It comprises of our proprietary nanoparticles and other consumables. There is a, an automation instrument, which is a fluid handler that, that automates the assay. And then there is a software suite on the back end that allows for the information that comes from a detector and the detector, in this case, the mass spec, to then go into a software suite and that biological data is translated to biological insight very easily for a user to, to take advantage of for whatever application that they're after. So what the proteograph offers then is the consumable, the automation instrument, and the software suite on the back end. What the customer provides is the detector, and that's the mass spec that many labs have. There's about 50,000 mass spec installed globally, about 15,000 of them do proteomic work today. And so the proteograph then sits upstream to that large install base of the mass spec, really enabled the scientific community to access proteomic content in ways that they couldn't before. Well, what do you say the SEER's short-term and long-term goals are, and what does it mean for the industry if you meet those? Our short, long-term goal is to continue to execute in enabling the scientific community to access proteomic content at speed scale that previously was impossible. And when you do that, you kind of expand this ecosystem that's going to benefit everyone. It's going to benefit the detector providers or the mass spec providers. It's going to enable, expand the market for the software providers. You're going to create entirely new end markets or expand existing end markets. So for example, just like with genomic content, came possible to do uh, liquid biopsy and early detection of cancer, those areas are going to materially uh, get enhanced with the addition of proteomic content that just previously wasn't possible to access. Now you can. That additional biological insight will expand all of those markets. And then I think entirely new end markets are going to get created uniquely because of access to the proteome that simply just wasn't possible with 
access solely to the genome or, or other omics like lipidomics or metabolomics. Now, that's all we're already seeing this play out. For example, we've now partnered with leading mass spec companies, Bruker, Thermo Fisher, Syax. Why? Because they saw the proteograph enabling a, a set of customers that are not their normal customers. So, for example, if you're a genomic customer and your business has largely been doing sequencing and accessing genomics content, and the proteograph now for the first time enables you to put that genomic content in terms of its functional relevance. So now the mass spec uh, providers have an opportunity to tap into that new market that they didn't or couldn't tap into before, and they can because of partnership with the proteograph. So we're seeing enhancement of the mass spec providers, data providers, you know, frankly, the clinical market as well. We spun off a company called Prognomic just about two years ago now. And Prognomic's business is liquid biopsy early detection, but multi-omics, core to which is deep unbiased proteomic enabled by the Prodigar product suite. Could you provide a, a brief overview of how customers are using Sears technology? Yes, of course. So as you can imagine, our customer types span pharma, translational labs, academic labs, CROs, by tech companies, pharma companies, with applications spanning from biomarker discovery, target identification, multiomic for cancer or other complex disease detection, and then really integrating proteomics and genomic content together to, for example, form or really kind of enable this field of proteogenomic, that the missing component for that enablement of proteogenomic has really been accessed to deep unbiased proteomic scale. And we're seeing the customers pursue studies that is unique to them, but super interesting. Uh, so for example, Cornell working with SpaceX, they did a proteomic profiling of, of astronauts who had gone out of space and back, kind of looking at their proteins before flight, during flight, after the land. And they actually found about 50 different proteins that were either upregulated or downregulated, differentially exchanged as a function of flight. And that's really interesting. So what does that mean biologically? I mean, it paves the road to really do an enormous amount of discovery in trying to understand, you know, what is the impact of space travel on people. Another provider, Evotech in Europe, one of our centers of excellence uh, in Europe that provides proteomic content to their own customers at the active CRO. They did a study that they presented recently at a conference of about 105 different samples looking at folks with chronic kidney disease, they were able to very rapidly go as deep as 3,000 proteins per subject, 5,000 proteins across their study, and looking at really low abundant proteins like many cytokines that you just couldn't access using traditional approaches, or if you could access it, it would create very long and complicated workflows in the proteomic space, by the way, that's things like immunodepletion of abundant proteins, fractionation of the balance of what you see. Those complicated workflows have always limited the size of the study that the scientific community could do. For example, before SEER, the largest published study that we were aware of in terms of deep unbiased proteomic in plasma was 48 samples. Now, put that in the context of what is happening today. We have customers like Oregon Health Sciences who's now completed the 1,000 sample study in prostate cancer. Prognomic, by the way, which is a company that we spun out, they've now done, you know, they haven't disclosed, but let me just say that over 1,000 samples, they, they presented a 196 sample study on pancreatic cancer, 92 pancreatic cancer subjects and 104 healthy subjects. And they were able to find 124 proteins that were statistically different between cancer and healthy subjects. So, so Brian, we're just seeing a breadth of applications that is as unique as our customers are and their needs are. Sounds like an exciting time. I guess on a similar note, I'm curious about what do you see as being the next big development product advancement that Sears pursuing that you're most excited about? Look, I'm excited about our product roadmap. The product that we launched is already having an enormous impact on our customers and we're beginning to see the presentations by them at scientific conferences. The community is asking us, you know, depending on their applications, you know, could we have an ability to, for example, integrate proteomic information uh, with genomic information more readily? So as you can imagine, our software guys are working, the team is working to enable proteogenomic analysis once the data comes out. We're also developing follow-on products 
that can make the customer access for your information even faster, even deeper, or with even less sample. So I think that future is very bright. We're literally at the very, very beginning of this trip, Brian. The analogy I would make is today we have sequenced over a million genome, over 10 million exomes, but that is, you know, 15 plus years after next generation sequencing was introduced. The first genome, you know, took 15 years and $2.7 billion to sequence, but now we're doing 48 sequencing in two days at a cost that is $1,000 and dropping rapidly. So an, an enormous amount of content became available. We're at the very, very beginning of the proteomics race, if you would, in terms of content generation. And so I think 15 years from now, there'll be a massive amount of content and insight that would have emerged because of large-scale access to proteomic information. Could have a pretty significant impact on the field of medicine over time. And, and I'm very excited about that. If it wasn't because of that, by the way, I would not have left my academic career after 20 years and being a professor there. But it's very exciting, Brian. Well, great speaking with you, Omid. Um, I appreciate the insights on the company and your background. And um, thank you for making time today. Thank you very much, Brian, for having me. Thanks so much. Be well. I'd like to thank Omid Farouksad for a great discussion. You can check out all of our previous Pharma 50 Talks episodes at drugdiscoverytrends.com, along with the rest of the featured stories that are part of this year's Pharma 50. Please be sure to like, follow, and subscribe to Drug Discovery and Development on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. Thanks for joining us. I hope you enjoy our features, and until next time.